Thank you all for coming, coming out on a rainy day. Uh, we're having a discussion about empowering women through skills and workforce development, where I really appreciate the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan of hosting this. Um, I really am grateful for our partnership with the Japanese government. We've done so many important things uh, with Japan. I think this is just another one in a series. So I really I want to thank the, the Japanese government. Um, I, we're doing this conversation in the context of the run-up to the G7. I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to figure out that we're going to do something. There'll be an important statement or some important work done on women's economic empowerment, given that the United States is going to be hosting uh, the G7 this year, and I think the uh, tireless and energetic championship of these issues by uh, Senior Advisor Ivanka Trump. So I think it's uh, timely and appropriate. Uh, we're hoping to do several of these in the run-up to the G7 on each of the pillars uh, of the women's economic empowerment, uh, the WGDP work. Um, in my mind, if I look at previous uh, G7 declarations there, they're uh, as aspirational and fluffy, I guess is how I would describe them. And so I think I'd like to hope that we can do something that's a little bit more um, concrete. Uh, and so that's my hope um, from this work. Um, we're going to have a conversation uh, with uh, some very thoughtful people um, to, to kind of unpack this discussion. But before we do that, I would like to ask my new friend, uh, Mayumi Ishikawa, who's a counselor for communications and cultural affairs at the Embassy of Japan, to make some welcoming remarks. So Ishikawa-san, could I ask you please to come up? Please welcome my friend Ishikawa-san. Good morning. My name is Mayumi Ishikawa. Uh, I'm the uh, uh, Counselor for Communications and Cultural Affairs at the Embassy of Japan. First of all, uh, I'd like to thank the CSIS for hosting this event and for the opportunity to discuss various policy issues to promote women's empowerment ahead of this year's G7 summit meeting in June. The current Abe administration places a high priority on its policies to advance women's participation in the workforce, workforce uh, sorry, workforce in Japan. Um, this issue is very important for me, being a woman myself, and um, I every day I struggle in the uh, workplace, uh, which is very male dominated. The, however, uh, the sorry the. Um, the current Abe administration places a high priority on its, uh, this policy area. However, uh, there still remains barriers, many barriers and challenges uh, facing Japanese women compared to women in other countries. Uh, although the number of women in management positions in Japan is increasing, but its ratio is only 50% compared to that of the United States, which is 40%. There still remains a significant pay gap between men and women among full-time employees, women earning about 75% to men. Mainly because, of the, the, mainly because of the above reason, Japanese women usually take main responsibility for child rearing. Some are forced to uh, take parental leave for significant, significant period of time. Against this backdrop, the government of Japan has been taking various measures, such as prohibition of discrimination based on gender at workplace, harass harassment prevention, taking positive actions based on the Equal Employment Opportunity Act of 1985. More recently, the act on promoting women's participation and advancement in all fields of, in society of 2014 was enacted this act makes it mandatory for big business owners to set action plans for improving women's participation in their workplace. In addition, the government of Japan hosts annual conference for women known as WOW with exclamation mark at the end, WOW, which stands for World Assembly of Women every year since 2014 to promote international discussions towards women's active participation in all fields of society. We invite women global leaders in various fields and discuss issues, not only economic empowerment, 
but also women and security or women's role in the event of a disaster. This year, WOW will take place in Tokyo on April 3rd and 4th, with its central theme as WOW with men. From the viewpoint of recognizing the importance of United Nations uh, He for She initiative uh, in the promotion of gender equality, we anticipate active and fruitful discussions with a wider participation of male panelists in the, in the plenary sessions, which aim to promote women's active participation in society. As for its international contributions, Japan hosted the G20 summit in Osaka last year. And in the Osaka leaders' declaration, uh, some of important commitments with regard to women's empowerment are included. I think many of you already know, but I will repeat here. So first, leaders committed to exchange their respective progress towards the uh, Brisbane goal to reduce the gap in labor force participation between men and women by 25% 20, by 2025. The second, leaders committed to continue support for girls and women, education and training, and improved access to STEM education. Third, leaders welcomed the launch of the private sector alliance among women business leaders for the uh, empowerment and progress, progression of women's economic representation. In addition, Japan committed 50 million US dollars toward the WeFi, or Women Entrepreneur Finance Initiative to advance women's entrepreneurship in developing countries, which was announced to create at the G20 Leaders Summit in Hamburg, Germany in 2017. As Japan has been actively involved in promoting women's empowerment within its country and internationally, we wish to collaborate and cooperate uh, with other countries in, the, in line with the Declaration of Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment issued at the G7 Leaders Summit in Biarritz, France last year. So we will be closely paying attention to the discussion at the next G7 Summit, which will be hosted by the United States uh, this summer. And as such, we hope to be able to gain many insights from today's discussion. Thank you very much. Angie Venza is with IYF, has had a 25-year career working with youth. And uh, my friend Katie Kaufman, who has run the very successful 2X initiative, and she has spoken here before at CSIS, and she's at the, the DFC. So thank you both for being here. Um, we wanted to talk about empowering women through skills and workforce development. Angie, let me start with you. And if you, were, if you had the pen and you were putting together a G7 statement or putting some goals together on skills and workforce development, what would be the things that you'd be thinking about given your work experience at IYF on these issues? Great. Thank you, Dan. I really appreciate your inviting me here and, and having IYF contribute to this conversation. I, um, IYF, for those of you who, who may or may not know us, we, we focus on, on working with young people around the world to make sure that they can realize the future they want, to make sure they're equipped and prepared for that. So of course, in that context, you know, building skills and workforce readiness is a big part of what we mm -hmm. do, and making sure that that is done with a lens of gender equity is a, is a fundamental part of, what, of how we approach our work. So some of the things that, from our experience in the ground, can really make a difference is, is starting with very, something very basic, with, which is equal access to education and training. Mm -hmm. That seems sort of like an obvious statement, but it's not always the case. Um, not only do not young people or young women not always have the same equal access, even when it's on paper they have the same access, there are a lot of barriers and, and other constraints in their environment um, that affect their ability to take advantage of those opportunities. And so often, um, so some of the things that really make a difference is really being very proactive about making sure that young women are not only accessing education and training, that you're removing the barriers 
that they face, whether those are sometimes cultural barriers, sometimes they're logistical barriers, um, barriers around you know, just um, transport to training sites or jobs, or things like um, you know, even being able to have you know, childcare in the places where they need to be. And, um, and the other piece is about making sure that the educational system is actually um, aligned with what is that what the labor market is demanding in the location that they're in and this is a ver this is very contextual what might be the the necessary or in-demand growth industries in you know in Bangalore might be different than Guadalajara and so you have to really look at each context but really make sure that that the schools and the and the um, employers in the given region are talking to each other and I have been able to play a role at bridging that conversation at times and once you have that information, you can actually have a better chance of influencing um, the, the, the guidance that's provided, particularly to girls, about where are the opportunities. Because what happens is often boys automatically get tracked into the STEM fields or into the, the, the industrial tracks. And, and, that's, and, and girls automatically get tracked into you know, the nursing or the teaching or administrative assistance tracks. And, and when young families and girls and teachers and guidance counselors don't understand what, un really understand the, the, the mechanics of the local labor market and where the opportunities are, they default to these, these traditional roles. But what we have found is when you can show them real data about the fact that if they take a, go in and study logistics or IT, that her, their daughter could have a potential threefold increase in, in what they would otherwise earn in the, in the administrative assistant track, those, those, some of those cultural barriers go away real quick because they, the money talks, right? And that actually can influence. So, so uh, in addition to sort of addressing some of the more sort of inherent cultural barriers, really just also using data about um, labor market um, trends can help, but then making sure that schools are prepared to get young women into those tracks and be able to support them when they're there with mentoring, with role models, with um, other types of, you know, making sure that there's even, um, you know, the, the equipment is accessible to them, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's sort of one, I think, big chunk. The other is, is um, the social emotional skill development mm. that is important for every young person and every adult person too. <laughs> And really, the imp it's, but it's especially helpful for young women who maybe have grown up without the sort of inherent um, promotion of their, of their agency, of their self-confidence, of their ability to, to speak up and advocate for themselves. And so helping young women really set goals that are, that are, that are um, accessible to them and showing them a path where they can do that, showing them role models, but also helping them build the communication skills and negotiation skills and time and money management skills that allow them to really take advantage of the, the educational opportunities when they can find them and then also take that to the workplace. And then I would say one last thing, if I'm not over No, please, no, go long, ahead. Um, would be to, to really look at, at how the, on the employer side, I'm talking mostly about employment, there's a whole other set of recommendations perhaps for entrepreneurship, but on the employment side, you know, making sure that employers um, also understand the data of the value of having young women take on non-traditional roles, but then preparing them to be able to make that feasible, because often what we've seen also is where young, peop young women you know, take the leap and decide to be you know, one of you know, two girls in a class of 50 boys in a, in a mechanical um, track. They get to the job site, and all of a sudden, even if the company is willing to hire them, there's, there's, there's a somewhat hostile environment. There's often no bathrooms for women. There's not uniforms that fit them. Simple things that you would think, but, but all those barriers, or that they are assigned shifts at night, and there's no safe bus for them to get there. And so, so there's a whole host of other barriers that get in the way, even if they manage to push through and take the leap of faith and, take and, and go through a non-traditional path. So making sure that, that policies and of employer workplace policies or educational policies really support that transition so that, so that the growth industries in a given country can actually take advantage of this other half of the population. All right, great. All right, so which one, is it me? All right, so we, we, your, your, your microphone is. Is not working? Oh no. No, no, it's just, it's working. It's just bumping up against your. 
we're doing like a technical moment here. Having a what was that? What was that? That's it. Technology is great. When it were in, so thank you, thanks, thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, Katie, thanks for being here. What a pleasure. Nice to. See, I'm really glad you're back here at CSIS. And okay, so you have led this very successful initiative that was started that you championed at OPIC and now at DFC called the 2X Initiative. The 2X Initiative was a U.S. initiative that's now been adopted by the G7 enthusiastically. And my hope is that we're going to be able to do something that rhymes with 2X on skills and workforce development at the next G7. So the reason I wanted to have you was to, A, to talk about the, talk about the um, 2X experience, what is it, talk about what some of the skills are that you actually need um, to access finance, and then if you had the pen and you were advising the folks who were going to go to Camp David and they were thinking about doing something that rhymed with what you did at 2X, for the skills and workforce development track, what would be some of the things that you'd suggest? So thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much to Japan for hosting this conversation. I think the fact that you've hosted uh, conversations like this is emblematic of what the G7 is good at and why we have a G7, which is we're like-minded partners. Um, I have heard many women that are passionate about women's economic empowerment talk about how do we seize this moment there's this moment that women have. And, and the truth is, the way I see it, is that this actually started to become a norm, a mainstream norm, when it became uh, elevated at the G7 for the first time during Italy's G7 presidency three years ago. That was the first time we had, at the ministerial level, a session on gender equality. And I think of it much like, a, you know, the opposite, I guess, of a revolution in the streets where people are out there talking about it, it's actually how you do change norms. When the G7 has said, this is actually uh, rises to the level of the most important economies. And it has continued throughout uh, until the United States G7, which if you haven't heard, we're a back to the basics approach. We are just coming together as the group of seven economies that have the most influence in the world. And because of what, uh, women's economic empowerment means for economies, we're still talking about women's economic empowerment as core, as back to the basics. So I think as a general statement, women have won, uh, the, the, and this, this is a revolution that is now a norm, and a critical norm. Um, so what do we need to do that rhymes with 2X? I am so happy we can just call it 2X. We can double down. Uh, during Canada's G7 presidency, the G7 development finance institutions came together with a commitment to mobilize $3 billion to support women as entrepreneurs, women as, as employees, and women as consumers. And w since that G7, we have mobilized $3 billion. More importantly, we've brought on five additional countries and one multilateral development bank. So what have we created? A definition for capital markets for what it means to invest in women. So we look at, um, for example, the green market. And there is ample opportunity for commercial investors to invest in the green economy. But we don't have... A, a, a SDG 5 economy. And we What's need SDG 5? Uh, gender equality. Okay. The sustainable development goal relating to gender equality by 2030. So what I think that the G7 is good at is thinking big, is being global, is saying this is the direction of the world. We are like-minded allies. We don't just tell other countries what to do. We show that we care. When we invest in another country, we care about the people that we invest in primarily right now it's women. And so I think that in this G7, if I had the pen, I would look to my counterparts and ask them, A, bring your dollars to this. The private sector can't do this alone. The, we, the development finance institutions work with the private sector, but we need government funds to go toward the soft skills, toward the training, toward the technical assistance. We need to leverage each layer of capital. I don't know if anyone had the opportunity to read the Bill and Melinda Gates annual letter from their foundation, but they really do a nice job of explaining governments can't do this alone, foundations can't do this alone, and the private sector can't do this alone. We all have different risk uh, profiles and appetite. but. 
the G7 can send a major powerful message through our shareholders in shareholder uh, status in the multilateral development banks, through our development finance institutions, through our aid dollars, and let's get the foundations in here so we're rowing in the same direction with a common goal of empowering women, not only as employees and giving them the skills they need, but also as managers, as leaders, as entrepreneurs, and we need to get them educated, we need to keep them healthy. Great. Okay, excellent. I want to talk about, Katie, the issue of if you want to get access to finance, there are certain skills you need to get access to finance. Can you talk about some of them? Like if I want to get a loan, if, if, if DFC lends money to a bank in Senegal or Guatemala or provides a lending guarantee and then in essence they go out and go and on lend that money or use that guarantee to provide lending to a small business owned by, that happens to be owned by a woman, there are certain assumptions built into somebody getting that loan. Talk a little about some of the assumptions that if you, if you want to go get access money from a bank in Guatemala, what are some of the things that you need to actually access that money? Sure. So when you look at the over $300 billion credit gap that women currently face in emerging markets and around the world, um, some of the things that we uh, early, early on identified were, number one, a lack of financial literacy. So uh, a lot of females that need access to credit don't have the background or skills to put together the package that a loan officer would look at to, to judge uh, if they would be a qualified borrower. Two, um, difficult to, to tackle, but there's an um, unconscious tax. bias by a lot of these loan officers that when a woman walks in the bank, she's a less loyal customer, she's a higher risk customer, uh, of course, we know the data is all exactly the opposite. Women are actually much more loyal customers, have much lower non-performing loan rates, um, and actually borrow at smaller amounts. Uh, so he, a lot of interesting dynamic there. Um, but then there are these soft skills uh, just about confidence, confidence to walk into the bank, confidence to explain your business and, and do so knowing that you are a competent uh, entrepreneur, employee, and that uh, consumer. And I think there are various ways that we can dr address each of these issues. And certainly, as I tried to insinuate in my opening comments, not every pool of capital is going to be suited to address those various points. For example, as a development finance institution, one way that we can use our capital to address that is that unconscious bias that may exist in that loan officer. So what we've done is when we're investing in a commercial institution, we reduce our fees by the amount that it costs that commercial institution to join something called the Global Financial Alliance for Women. Then that bank has the opportunity to join this alliance, learn from their peers, understand the market opportunity that they're missing if at least 30% of their folio, it, portfolio is not going to female borrowers, understand how they can market better to female borrowers, understand how they can serve female borrowers better, and understand how they can recognize women as an opportunity to bring down those, uh, those unconscious bias barriers. And a lot of that has to do with really simple questions that we can do during our underwriting process. For example, questions that we never used to ask before we launched 2X. How many women are in management at your bank? How many of your loan officers are women? Well, no one had asked these questions before, and it's actually quite fascinating when the bank responds, none or two, you know. And then they are able to look at the mirror themselves. Because once you see that your opportunity is in women and you don't have women serving those customers, you can easily identify that this is not a do-good exercise. This is for the bottom line of a commercial financial institution. So again, along the full spectrum, you need all kinds of capital. You need the capital that's going to give women the soft skills. You need the capital like DFIs that are going to push the commercial institutions to understand the opportunity that women represent. Um, and you need the private sector to invest along with you and also serve as that lever to, to affect change. So I'm listening to this conversation. I'm, I'm thinking if I was running the G7 process, I'd want to have some kind of a pregame, since it's Camp David's a pretty teeny place, but I'd want to have some kind of a pregame with big multinationals, some banks, big philanthropy, aid donors, and DFIs just on, on the women's economic empowerment thing. So as I'm thinking about this, I'm gonna recommend that it, if I was running it, that's what I would be doing because I think there's not gonna be enough space, both in terms of in physical space, 
but also in terms of um, uh, the, you know that there's going to need to be almost some kind of a parallel track to kind of help prep this because you're, you're going to need a coalition of the willing. Uh, you know, it's the kind of stuff that IYF has always done is worked in multi-stakeholder approaches to solving these problems of workforce development. That's what IYF has always done. And then what you've just said, Katie, makes, it makes a lot of sense to me and it, it reflects the fact that we're going to need a lot of different stakeholders to solve this problem. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Let me, let me push on a couple of other things while I have both of you. Um, it seems to me that you need, in addition to this equal access to education and training, Angie, that you were talking about, and vocational technical training, and is this, we, uh, Katie raised this issue of soft and emotional skills. Could you just talk a little bit about soft skills and how you think about them? Uh, you made some, I, I agree with everything you said, but how does soft skills, or, or let's call them emotional intelligence, or, or whatever, or people skills, or just being able to function in, you know, send thank you notes and you know answer you know answer emails in such a way or learning how to pitch your business or this kind of stuff how does that fit into what you were saying sure well all the things that you just mentioned are important but I, but i way of thinks of soft skills really as at even a much more holistic and and sort of fundamental level which is basically the the skills one needs to be able to navigate their world the path you take the um, be able to do things like set goals for yourself, like know how to communicate um, with your classmates, your family, your work colleagues, Learn, know how to you know, manage your time and your money, know how to work in a team, creative thinking, critical thinking. These are all the skills actually that employers across the world, and this is really universal every, in the US, in Africa, and wherever you go, employers, regularly say that some of the that they struggle to find strong um, basic soft skills in a lot of the young people that they try to hire maybe not only only young people but but they these are these are skills that employers have trouble finding and it's because often they are not taught in an intentional way they're not taught in an effective way um, and what IWF has been doing over the past 15 years is really is is provide a framework for um, instilling soft skills um, of all sort of sorts. We actually have a curriculum called Passport to Success. It's got a hundred lessons in it. Nobody gets all hundred lessons. The idea is that you can tailor your selection of the lessons to, to the profile of the young person or the context you're working in. So if it's a young person going through an entrepreneurship program or it's in high school versus uh, an out of school, out of work, you know, really vulnerable young person, you can really tailor it. And, and and what really is important about, about soft skills is they, they form the foundation for you to be able to then navigate um, challenges you come across, solve problems, address, be able to sort of think creatively and, 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 um, and, and solve conflicts when you're on the job or in your, in your school environment or whatever environment you're in. And, so, and, and one of the um, important things about them is that while a lot of people give lip service to them, they're not always taught in a way that actually helps young people acquire them. And so the, what we have learned over time is that the way that you have to, that you can teach life skills, and they are absolutely learnable skills, is that you need to do it in a way that's interactive, that allows young people to reflect on the skills, reflect on how they apply in their own lives, and actually practice them. So, you know, teaching teamwork by, you know, writing on the chalkboard teamwork definition, you know, and, and filling out a worksheet doesn't really get you there. And so, so we've been able to really move the needle, I think, in, uh, with a lot of young people around the world with this. And one of the things we're doing right now, actually, is, is we've just launched, in collaboration with PepsiCo Foundation, a version of, of Passport to Success called Passport to Success Traveler. And it's an online mobile app, which is actually designed specifically to, um, to be a, uh, responsive and, and accessible to young women. So it was designed by testing it with young women about the skills that they need, that they care about in a way that makes it accessible to them. So we're hoping that we're going to reach a million young women through this with PepsiCo's support. It's fabulous. So it's, and it's free. It's on a mobile app. It's very accessible. You can do it in chunks and pieces. It's, so it makes it very easy to learn. And we're, we're very... Um, we know that this is something that you know employers and on, and you know a, a finance a financial institution um, or whoever is interacting with 
a young person in, in a sort of professional environment is, is they, they value these skills. These are what we need in the 21st century. Our, our current skills are, 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 you know, as people say, in the fourth industrial revolution that we're in, the skills that are going to matter are the ones about creative thinking and, and problem solving and teamwork and, and sort of thinking out of the box. And, and so those, are, those skills are going to be useful for the long term. So Katie, I, I think it's, um, you know, one of the things I think about is that there are many entrepreneurs who may or may not have all the skills necessary, or they may not be operating in the formal economy in these countries, so they may not be able to access a bank loan, that you need certain skills that we were talking about in the pregame of this, that you need business skills, financial skills, and actually the, the phrase financial literacy came up. Talk a little bit about some of these basic, basic skills a little bit more. I know you've referenced them earlier, but just talk a little bit about them because it seems to me that either this is going to have to be something that institutions like IYF train to or institutions like AID or JICA uh, are going to have to finance or government, governments in developing countries are going to have to fund because it seems to me that those are sort of assumed. You need those skills just to be able to get access to the, to the, to the bank loan. Uh, sure, and I think there's all different levels here. I mean, um, depending on the type of loan that you are seeking and the size that is appropriate for you, um, the Village Savings and Loan Program is one that we were uh, previously talking about mm -hmm. that is certainly scalable and has been incredibly successful. And those are, those are community-based. So I, I'm certainly not an expert in this, but when I um, when uh, DFC invests in high impact funds that do microfinance, the ones that we look for are those that provide services that wrap around. That, it, funny enough, Dan, it's not just financial literacy that some of these provide. They provide health services too. So they're bringing together uh, groups of women in in, uh, in certain areas. They're teaching them um, when they should uh, go to doctors, how they address issues, even issues of obesity and diabetes. Um, they're teaching them about financial literacy and how to save for future incidents, weather incidents or um, others that affect their home. Um, these are the type when we're talking about not all impact being created equal. So microfinance is great. We, the Development Finance Institution uh, has over, I think, $2 billion in microfinance loans around the world. And one thing we know about that is that women are $2 billion more in debt around the world. Mm. Um, but when we look at the when we look at the our investees that provide microfinance with wraparound services, with financial literacy training, with healthcare training, those are the type of institutions that we know they're measuring impact, they're reporting on results. That that's the kind of thing that I would like to see us um, push more into. Those that have the the greater wraparound services and the greater commitment to measuring and reporting. So. One of the things that came up, the Sustainable Development Goals, I've done 10 of the 17 SDGs. I don't, I'm a sucker for punishment, I guess, or it's because I don't know. It, it's uh, hard to do all 17 of them, but I've done 10 of them so far. I'm collecting all 17 of the goals. I have a hard time keeping track of all of them, and I know there are 169 sub-indicators, but it seems to me one of the things that came out of the conversation that we had prior to this is that Perhaps you could take some of the sub-indicators on, um, on, uh, on, uh, on the SDGs and use those as the building blocks for skills and workforce development for the G7 in terms of just using that. Now, I think you have to be careful about how we talk about the SDGs. There's sort of, you know, there's, there's about 20 members of Congress in the US Congress that know what the SDGs are. They're all Democrats. There are three mayors in the United States. Now, I know several of you are going to get very upset with me saying this. There's three mayors of progressive cities that know what the SDGs are in the United States. However, all the, big, the top Fortune 50 multinationals know what it is. So what you've seen is there's been a big pickup in the, business, in the US business community. Now, I, like I said, some people are going to be very unhappy that I've described it this way. But there's, there is a limited audience in Washington for the SDGs. And so that's been my public service. You're welcome. My public service has been to try and do each of these because it's not well understood in DC. So, but I think you could, as a practical exercise, if you were organizing, you were doing the women's economic empowerment stuff for the G7, is you could take 
those Lego building block pieces and you could even do potentially working groups around each of those and say, okay, what could I, how could I backward map from that and come up with some numerical goals? So that might be a way if I was running the working group on the G7, I'd be thinking about that because it's a common language across the world. It's a very clever way of everyone being on the same page and being able to talk about it. Like I said, I have not memorized all 17 of them. So when people say, goal six or goal 10, I get intimidated because I haven't memorized them yet. But um, so, so with all of that said, I'd like to ask each of you, what do you think about using the sustainable development goals as a way of kind of building up to a goal, with some, some concrete things? Because I described the Be a Ritz declaration as pretty fluffy and not kind of airy. Um, I'd like to see something more concrete. So, so first question to both of you is SDGs as a way to get to something more concrete. And then separately, uh, if, if, let's put aside whether it's the SDGs or not, what would be some good numeric goals and what, how, would they, how would you talk about them around skills and workforce that you might want to put out there for the G7 in June that would feel real and meaningful? So, okay, let me start with you, Angie. Um, You're helping do a million, helping work with a million people with PepsiCo Foundation, so we need to be thinking about millions, right? Absolutely. Not just, not 50,000. 50,000 is probably not the number. No, right? I think we, okay. we need to talk about big numbers, and we, maybe we need to even talk about, um, you know, really shifts of, of even, you know, talking about percentages even perhaps in terms of, you know, when you're, when you're asking a, or you're working with a, with a, a government where, uh, of a country that really wants to move the needle on, on mm. young women, it's, I don't think it's just a matter of saying we need to reach this a million girls. I think it's about how do we make sure that, you know, 50% of the young people who are, are, are um, get earning skills around high, in high growth industries are women, are young women and not men, and, and not only men. So. So I mean, there, there, you could look at it. You could try to look at some targets. Maybe that's ambitious, <laughs> right? But, but I mean, you could you could try to start, you know, shifting the needle of and making sure that, um, you know, all young women are that are are not only have access to school in theory, but that, you know, that there are investments made to make sure that you know that all young women are able to get to school and have, you know, and if that means, you know, providing childcare or providing transport or whatever, you know, how could, could we set targets around making sure that, that, um, that there's actually equal access and that okay. gender equity is, is, is looked at on a, on a whole scale, not just a sort of certain number of people, because that's actually hard to, to measure and track, but, but maybe there are policies that can, that can be well, proposed. We're going to write a paper on this and kind of a memo to the stakeholders on, on this specific. We're going to try and have an event on each of the three pillars of WGDP and the run up to the G7. So I'm, if folks have ideas, uh, send them to me or, or Sundar. Uh, you know, short emails better than super long email. So that would be welcome. Okay. So Katie, what's your thoughts about this? Um, so I'll have to answer as Katie and not as a political opponent. Oh, I know. That, that, um, I, I like those answers better. I do think the SDGs are a fantastic uh, way to track, measure, get buy-in. Uh, one of the challenges with the G7 is that we each have presidencies. The presidency rotates. And each presidency wants to have their crowning achievement and credit. And you know, we're all like-minded, and we're all trying to achieve something. Let's, let's let the SDG 5 get credit. Let's not build a whole new thing every time we're trying to create something. Um, let's leverage the existing work that's being done and work on, uh, double down on what's working. So yes, I think SDG 5 uh, would be a, an excellent banner to, to underwrite against. And I think the United States loses credibility in the development space when we shy away from that. Mm -hmm. I think uh, everyone can agree that the United Nations needs reform and needs to be uh, shook up. Um, but yeah. we can also agree that we want to end poverty and have equality. Yeah. So, so I'm a huge fan. So, so thank yeah, you for letting I'm me say that. Good, thank you. So I'm, I'm a big proponent. The, uh, the UN was set up by the, the, uh, the uh, by uh, the United States. It works better when the U.S. leads. Um, I think that 95% of the UN is unobjectionable. There's sort of 5% is like our pain points. I'm not going to get into what the pain points are. 
but uh, I would just say that um, that it's uh, so the U.S. should not be allergic to lots of the things in the U.N. I would say that given that China's doing a far better job in the last five years of winning leadership jobs in the spec, there's 180 of these obscure, weird named UN agencies that have really important uh, agencies like WIPO. Uh, so if you don't know what WIPO is, you can go Google WIPO and my last name, and you'll see the paper I wrote, WIPO for dummies, because it's really important. Or when they won the air traffic and controllers won and kicked the Taiwanese out, that wasn't so fun anymore. So I think we actually, as the United States, have to pay more attention to the UN. Uh, not just for all the reasons that, you know, because it's good government and it's the right thing to do, because the Chinese are eating our lunch in the UN. So we need to get back in the game on these multilateral institutions um, for all the reasons that folks would want to have a conversation about the UN, but we also need to do it for national interest and geostrategic reasons. So. Good. And the last point on um, setting targets, I, I agree with you and I uh, like 2x set that target and it gives us something um, to, to work against and hold ourselves accountable. Workforce skills and training is a little bit more difficult because if we're training millions of women to build the next, to build a VCR, we What's haven't that? really served them. Exactly. What is that? A VCR. You remember you used to go to the Blockbuster Video. And oh, like, VCR, like VCR, like those things, like yeah. VHS VCR? Yeah, I'm, it was a simpler the, time. The, I remember it, right? Oh, those is, things. I don't um, use my DVD the anymore. The training is not important. It's the job. So I think we have to look at, and people respond, it's, you know, there's, incentives matter. And so we have to set the right ins incentives and we have to be sure that we're driving towards the ultimate goal, which is um, empowered women, uh, women with agency, and women with not just any job, but a quality job, and one where they're valued. You know, I'm, I'm gonna have to go look up VCR on the interwebs <laughs> and see, you know, see what I learned. That's fantastic, great. Oh my God, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm a mess. Anyway, so thank you for that, Katie. All right, let's call, I'd like to get this a very thoughtful audience. So you get extra credit if you say your name and your organization and you keep your statement short or your question to a question that's short. If you, grandstanding's not frowned upon and I'll cut you off, okay? So please don't do that to me. So I'd like to see questions, please. This woman here, this woman here. I'm gonna bunch them together, okay? So this woman, who else? Third person, this is your chance. Don't be shy. Okay, yes please. Hi, my name's Liz Myers and I am a principal associate at Nathan Associates. We just did a gender audit of the power company of Mozambique looking at how to get more women in the energy sector there. And every employee we spoke to basically admitted that sexual harassment was a key wow. barrier. Men and women coming forward saying it was incredibly prolific. So wondering how that has been addressed in any programming and how we can push to get that further on the agenda because it was really seen as one of the key constraints for getting women in this, especially this very non-traditional sector. That's shocking. That's, really, that's a really interesting study. Thank you very much. The other person over here, please. Anyone else? I'm, I'm, catch, I'm collecting questions. This is the moment. Okay. Uh, Laurie Krieger from the Manoff Group. Since it's not just gender, there's intersectionality, there's also class. How do you make sure that the poor girls don't get uh, channeled into the skills that you need to build a VCR in a factory and the wealthier girls get management positions? Okay, great. Okay, thank, and thanks for modeling brief, everybody. That's great. Okay, so let's, Katie, Angie. Okay, I, I'll, I'll um, hi Liz, oh, nice to see you. Um, first of all, thank you for doing those type of studies. Um, those are the type of influential pieces of work that um, my office shares with our investment team and um, they take that stuff to heart. Uh, if you looked at OPIC's, or DFC's portfolio, the two largest sectors are financial services and energy. And we've made energy core to uh, 2X. We have an entire paper uh, that helps our underwriters underwrite energy deals differently to incorporate gender as part of their investment analysis. And Right up there in the top of the questions is, you know, what sort of grievance mechanisms do you have in place? How can you address um, any sort of harassment or safety in the workplace, particularly for your female employees? And enterprises that don't have that in place, they want to have that in place. We help them get there. Um, IFC is the gold standard in getting this done. I've worked with their gender team specifically on an energy deal that we co-finance together. And having the two largest financers 
on the line, and it's not me doing the talking, it's my male investment officer who comes across as a big jerk New York underwriter. And he's saying, I've got to have this policy in place, and I've got to make sure that you have women in management, because unless we see 30% women in management, this doesn't trickle down into the rest of your organization. And when you don't have a happy, productive workforce, my IRR goes down. It's a totally different conversation than we've had before, and I think it's one that resonates with the underwriters. Um, so I hope that that's, I hope that that, I'm a huge proponent of um, money being the single most powerful lever for change. And I think that we're just starting to understand how we can use money for, for gender equality. And energy sector is the least diverse. It's worse than finance. Um, so we're working on it. And um, I think you've addressed, uh, asked a question that we haven't addressed in our own country. Um, I, I certainly at the Development Finance Corporation, our uh, legislation calls on us to only be focusing on the lowest income countries, which is a shift for us. Um, we have just doubled what we call our portfolio for impact. That's the piece of the agency, the business group that underwrites higher risk and um, deeper impact projects. So I think we are trying to be as impactful as possible uh, in the, to the folks that need it the most. Um, but I certainly think we're behind the curve when it comes to other development agencies. And I'll just say that we're, we're doing our best and we're, we're doubling our efforts, which, which means something. Okay, Angie. Sure, let me um, start by addressing the question about, um, about the, the skills and training and getting, you know, sort of a, the, the class differences in the in the um, job placement kind of scenario. I think that I think it's first of all IWF tends to work with populations that are in the lower socioeconomic levels, and I think there's some very clear um, barriers that are faced in terms of you know getting onto a real growth path and, and making sure you're getting up to management levels. I, I don't know if we've solved that, but what I do know is that particularly for young women, you know, really understanding where the, the promising, well-paid jobs are um, in a given um, local economy is really critical and making sure that young women um, are also getting access to those. Because what, what we have found, we tend to work with, with you know, populations that maybe whose families probably don't have, often don't have the resources to, to send their young girls or boys to university. Some of them do get there, of course. Um, but, but I think a lot of what um, really matters in terms of getting into a, a job that has um, opportunity and growth and salary potential, growth potential, is making sure that you're providing them with the, the skills that match what the local economy and the local growth sectors are. So making sure that young women, for example, I mean, we've had, I'll give you a couple of examples. In one place in Mexico where we worked, we, were, we looked at what, where the growth opportunities, where, where were the job vacancies that were not getting filled, that, that well paid, and these are not necessarily jobs that require a university degree, but, but that require a, a good technical certification and there's, you know, a, a, the employers are struggling to fill these positions. Meanwhile, you know, the, these technical high schools had hundreds of girls coming out with a graphic design degree, which might, you know, not sound like a bad degree to get, but in that local environment, maybe there were 50 jobs a year and hundreds of girls coming out for them. Meanwhile, in IT, logistics, in, in auto mechanics, there were, you know, they, they, the employers weren't able to fill the jobs. And those were jobs, those technical jobs are not bad jobs. Quite the contrary, they're actually well paid and, and have potential to, to yeah. provide a growth path. Um, and I mean, this is a, this is a bit of, a, of um, a sort of bias against kind of a technical vocational track jobs that exists in the everywhere. US as well as everywhere, yeah, right? Maybe. And and so so it's not just a matter of, oh, it's a technical job or it's not a technical job or it's a job without a college degree. You know, there are there are very good, well paying and jobs that put you on a very good growth path. The question mm -hmm. is in this context, how do we make sure girls are actually getting access to those yeah. and not just the boys? Um, because the, the there is a tr there is mm -hmm. a lot of growth potential there. We've we've been able to shift it so that mm -hmm. girls families are, of girls who mm. get these jobs are able to get 
are, you know, yeah. really literally double the family income, yeah. take the family into the middle class because of a, of a well-placed, you know, we we don't we don't tell stories about people who do who succeed in vocational technical contexts. Uh, I have a family friend who has a very successful elevator repair company. He has 200 employees in eight states. He's worth probably 25 million bucks. I mean, that's probably worth more than most investment banking managing directors ever will make at Goldman Sachs or whatever you'd make at BCG as a partner. But that's not the way we talk about it. We talk about it like, oh, that's a Oh, to poor him. Well, poor him. He's got 200 people working for him. He's got like three BMW 7 Series cars and six houses. So, so we, you know, and, and, a, and, a, and a big stock portfolio. My, my point is, I don't think we, we spend way too much time. And I, you know, this, this area, the six counties around Washington are the wealthiest in the United States and the most educated counties in the United States. And so we have an enormous bias towards getting a master's degree or a PhD. It's unthinkable to not get a college degree. And so there's a stigma if you don't get a college degree. Um, there, you know, uh, one, uh, there was a, recently a US presidential candidate who was a very serious contender um, who had not finished college, and this was a knock against him. And uh, what percentage of the US population has a college degree today? I think it's 35%. But you'd think, given the milieu, that's the French word, the milieu that we're in here, right? You'd think 99% of the people do. It's 35%. Now, if you look at the cohort of folks coming up, it's something closer to 45%. And if you look at developing countries, I have no idea. I'm on the board of a university in Ghana, a Shesi University. I don't know what the percentage of, I don't know, did I say something? Is that what I'm saying? I don't know what percentage of Ghanaians go to university, but I bet it's not more than five or ten percent. So, I think we, I think this issue of class, I think, is an interesting one. But I think we actually have to look at ourselves too, because I think I look at our biases. We say, oh well, if you don't have a PhD from, you know, from from Harvard, or you don't have, you know, then you know, then you're nobody, right? Or if you don't, if you don't have, you're not a partner at BCG, you know, you're a failure. You don't have, you know, you're doing, you're not a partner at an OBGYN practice or something, and has got six offices. Then you know, so I think we have to re, we're going to have to reset our thinking. I think there's a very strong bias in the education establishment. There's a very strong bias in political leadership all over the world, including in this country, against this. And so we don't hold them up. I think this, this Dirty Jobs uh, TV show that was so successful, I think, was a way of kind of breaking some of these taboos. So I think it's, a, I think it's very interesting. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you raised it. And I think it's, we should all look at ourselves when we, when we, when we ask this question, because I think it's an interesting and important question. Um, so last call. Last call if someone's got one last, okay, this woman here and this, this, these two folks here, and that's it. Name, organization, short question or comment, okay? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Loti Salazar, I'm a corporate governance officer with IFC. Thank you very much for your kind words of support to my organization. Um, I lead a program that promotes more uh, female representation in boardrooms around the world. And we also try to help grow the pipeline of female talent to ascend to senior management positions, which you mentioned. Um, I know that the conversation here focused a lot on young women, but we focus the program on mid-career and also senior management. What would be your advice for these women um, around the world? That's one. The second is, what would be your advice in terms of skills and workforce development for women entrepreneurs in uh, fragile and conflict-affected uh, countries? Thank you. Okay, and this woman here. Thanks so much. Katie Vicklin with Palladium. What do you view as the major barriers that are keeping the impact investors and the private capital from helping us to address the workforce development challenges in a sustainable way in the countries in which we work? How can we get more of their risk profile, of their capital, uh, engaging with us in these important problems? We always say seven to one, uh, you know, for every dollar invested in early childhood education, the returns are seven, and yet it's hard to get everyone at the table I'm um, working together, and I would welcome your insights. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, th 
Thank you from the IFC. I would have to ask them for advice. I have no advice for senior executive women. Um, one thing I would advise uh, the places where they work is to become EDGE certified, which I know the World Bank and IFC are EDGE certified. Uh, DFC is EDGE certified. We're the first US government agency to ever become EDGE certified. We did it because Google our board. It's appalling. Um, that's a, it's an international standard based out of Switzerland uh, that looks at equity in the workplace and helps you bring back down systematic barriers uh, that keep you from having a level playing field. It's a fantastic uh, certification process. Um, in terms of mobilizing additional impact dollars to skills and workforce development and frankly just mobilizing more impact dollars in general, um, I, there is an overused word in finance right now, blended finance vehicle. Um, hopefully you are all familiar with it. I actually um, think it's a, a huge tool that we haven't quite uh, mastered in order to bring those, those super impactful dollars in the door. We just haven't quite figured out how to scale a blended vehicle, which means we're putting debt on a stack of capital different types. Folks that are foundations that are willing to take all the risk, folks like the development finance institutions that are very patient capital, and then just commercial investors, and figured out a way to bring them all together for a common aim. Um, I frankly have been a very strong proponent of what we are calling at DFC radical collaboration. And this is this crazy idea that if you can get people together in a room with a, with a goal in mind, you can achieve something. And we've been doing that. We uh, launched last year something called Maternal Outcomes Matter, or MOMS, with Credit Suisse, Merck for Mothers, USAID, and the Development Finance Corporation. 10 years ago, if someone told you that the Development Finance Corporation was investing in maternal health in sub-Saharan Africa, they would have said, oh, no, 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 they build, ro they build toll roads in Ecuador. It is radical for us to be involved, but the level of expertise and the grant capital that comes with these other agencies allows us to shift the dynamic so that the enterprises that are providing the services in country that lead to better health outcomes for women, that have been basing their entire business on writing that next grant to Merck for Mothers or USAID, are now engaging with Merck for Mothers, USAID, and a commercial lender to say, how can I use this grant money to build my case, uh, to create the financial model, to put everything in place I need to get the loan so that I can become a sustainable enterprise going forward? That's a type of radical collaboration that is going to lead to opportunities for impact investors. I just don't think that the opportunities are clear and present and available for the impact investors. So there's both a supply and a demand problem. And if we can build up enough supply and sh demonstrate that this type of investing pr provides both uh, commercial and social returns, I think that's the future of the world. OK, Angie. Um, these are all um, really interesting questions. I'm not sure I can really speak to the mid management question either. Unfortunately, it's not really our, our my scope either. Um, I mean, I think I, what IWF has seen work in terms of leveraging resources is to really always look for the opportunities for public-private partnership, whether that's with impact investing or a combination of public and private funding. Um, for opportunities, and I think really trying to bring in a lens and working with our with our donors, whether that's a combination of, of USAID and Hilton or PepsiCo or FedEx or other groups that we work with, and and getting them on board to to look at how we can really make sure that their investment is sustainable. I'm not sure that all the things that we do will produce a an economic outcome for an investor, but. But I think looking at the ways that we are actually shifting systems locally and making sure that the investments are not just a one-time thing, but that they really move the needle in terms of how um, young people are educated in a given place, whether how employers and, and schools are, are working together in a more sustained way to make sure that they're keeping up on, on what are the current skills that are needed. We've been able to do, our, our work has really shifted in recent years toward 
what we call systems change, and it's really about not just coming in and saying we're going to train a thousand young people, but rather we're going to work integrally, intimately with a school system to and play a bridging role between the, the employers in that region and the school system and show them how to continually communicate so that the school systems can shift and meet the, meet the labor needs of the local environment. And that has an economic shift. I'm not quite sure yet how to, how to calculate it, perhaps in a, in a in an, in return on investment way, but, but it, it, I think it's, it's a compelling way of talking about using development dollars to really make sustainable change and, and shift the way, what we've been able to do is sort of shift the way schools interact with employers, shift the way schools approach um, on, um, on the job training opportunities, the way they approach career guidance, the way they approach teaching life skills or technical training. And so what we do is, I mean, that, that investment then leaves behind um, uh, not just uh, a group of young people that got trained, but rather a whole system that now has the ability to to shift the way that they work to make sure that that um, the young people they're educating are actually better prepared for the econ uh, local economy, which has an economic impact ultimately. Well, good. Can you join me in thanking these wonderful panelists? This was just great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Angie. I really appreciate it. Thank you.